So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone here worldwide. We are very happy to have Emil Werner with us from MIT. Hi Emil. Hey Marcus. Good to have you. We will talk today about debt, the debt inflation channel and uh, the analysis on the German hyperinflation and inflation from 1919 and to 1923. Uh, and before I start, I would like just to make a, an opening statement briefly and give the poll results you generously contributed to the webinar. I just, it was important that the hyperinflations are very, very important periods. And uh, Rudy Dornbusch called it the hyperinflations are the laboratory of monetary economics. So these are really important periods where we can learn a lot about inflation. Of course, this assumes some linearity. There might be some non-linearity we will learn today about these two things might change between inflation and hyperinflation. But, you know, there's a very important work on this hyperinflation from many authors, and I just listed here two classic uh, papers, one by Sargent, where he studies the ends of four big inflations, and the German hyperinflation was one of these four big inflation periods. He emphasized very much the fiscal monetary interaction and also the political credibility needed to stop uh, the inflation. But once you have the political credibility on the fiscal side combined as an evidence for rational expectations, you can actually bring inflation down. Rudy Dornbusch actually studied it too, but he focused more on the FX market. And we will you know, also touch on the FX market as well, the foreign exchange market uh, briefly as well. Now, for your poll questions, I think we had five poll questions for you. And the first one was, uh, did people anticipate you know, in 1919 to 1923 in Germany, whether inflation, you know, will come and will be so high, will be translating into hyperinflation. And the first thing is, no, they were surprised at any time when inflation was actually going up further and further. That's what 27 people thought. Partially they anticipated it, but at first, but the people learned over time, that's what 67 people thought. And yes, they anticipated it widely, 5%. So the majority really thought they partially anticipated it. And I think you might be surprised uh, what the actual, what email will tell us uh, in a few minutes. Um, so what was the fundamental cause of the inflation? Was it high money growth? Uh, was it fiscal deficits? Uh, was it an exchange of depreciation, so other shocks? And uh, people said very much, you know, it was money growth uh, up to 55%. And fiscal deficits was 22%. That's, you know, contrary to what Tom Sargent just uh, mentioned uh, previous, in the previous slide. Exchange rate, only 2% attributed to. And other shocks, for example, the First World War, uh, 22%. So 55, 22, 2, and 22. Uh, what are the, the third question was, what are the main expansionary channels of inflation? Was it that the real wages declined? because potentially of wage stickiness, or was it redistribution towards debtors? And the answers you gave us was 58% versus 43%. Okay, so we will then argue, you know, or email will argue in a very particular direction. The fourth question was, what are the main contractionary channels of inflation? Was it the resource of misallocation, price dispersion that couldn't adjust the prices? Or was it financial instability leading to a credit crunch? increased uncertainty over some other reasons. And the answers were 31%, 35%, 27%, and 6%. So essentially, it's between the first and the second. Uh, and then uncertainty is also a big contributing factor. And finally, given that we have high inflation right now, of course, you would like to know what's a good hedge against the high inflation, even hyperinflation, where it's stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, or others. And your answers were 12% stocks are a good hedge. Bonds, zero, because nominal bonds essentially are not good against that. Nobody attributed anything to that. Commodities, 33%. And real estate, 55%. So people thought real estate would be the most people thought real estate is the bad head, best hedge against inflation. You might be surprised about this too of the email tells you what really happened. Um, so with this, I pass on the floor to email, the virtual floor, and we're looking forward uh, to your presentation. And please ask questions uh, as they come along. Thanks again, Ima. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Yeah, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you and a pleasure to be presenting this paper, of which I'm I'm part of a really great team. Um, so this is joint work with with Marcus as well as with uh, Sergio Correa, who's at the Fed Board, 
Stefan Luck, who's at the New York Fed, uh, and Tom Zimmerman, who's at the University of uh, Cologne. Um, and because of our co-authors affiliations, we should just say that the views here uh, do not necessarily represent those of the Fed uh, uh, Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve Board. Okay, so with that disclaimer, let me jump uh, right in. In this paper, we're, we're trying to think about how inflation, especially very high inflation, transmits to uh, the real economy, what the relevant channels are. And in particular, we want to think about the role of a financial channel that we call the debt inflation channel that operates through firm financing frictions. So the debt inflation channel is related to old ideas that go back to at least to Keynes and, and Irving Fisher, and it operates as follows. If you have unexpected inflation, then in the presence of nominal debt contracts, this is gonna to lead to wealth redistribution to net nominal debtors benefiting uh, these debtors. Now, if these debtors are financing constrained, then the increase in their net worth uh, may relax that financing constraint, give them more uh, liquidity that they can, for example, use uh, to invest or to hire more workers. And that can have real effects increasing output by relaxing these financing constraints. So we wanna think about what the role of this debt inflation channel is relative, for example, to uh, the new Keynesian channel that operates through price and wage rigidity that has received more attention in the literature on the transmission of inflation to the real economy. So what we're gonna do in this paper, as, as Marcus uh, already, already said, is we're gonna use the German inflation of 1919 to 1923 as essentially a laboratory to study how really high inflation transmits to the real economy through this debt inflation channel. So uh, the German inflation is one of the canonical events uh, in monetary history. From an exchange rate of 4.2 marks the dollar in 1914, the mark ultimately depreciated to 4.2 trillion marks to the dollar by the end of 1923. So trillion, that's 10 to the 12th. So this is a massive uh, depreciation. And this is uh, an episode that generations of economists have sought to understand uh, in order to try to better get a sense of what are the fundamental causes of inflation, uh, as well as its macroeconomic and distributional uh, effects. So Marcus uh, already uh, referenced some of these studies and, and, and here are some of the other important studies uh, in, in this literature. So we think that there are several appealing features of, of this setting in order to think about these questions. So first, I'm gonna argue that inflation was largely unanticipated at the outset of, 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 of the inflation. So we can think about this as an unexpected shock, at least from the beginning of the inflation. Second, the massive increase in the price level puts this debt inflation channel into sharp relief because it leads to very large changes on real balance sheets through these nominal debt positions. And third, our innovation here, one of our innovations is gonna to be to bring newly digitized data, especially newly digitized micro firm level data, which is gonna let us disentangle mechanisms, I think uh, in, in more detail, in a more granular way uh, than what the previous literature could do. So let me just summarize our three main findings before getting into uh, the details. So first, we're gonna start uh, by showing some aggregate evidence on this debt inflation channel. In particular, what we see during the German hyperinflation is there's a massive fall in leverage of non-financial firms. In particular, leverage falls by about 50%. Uh, and similarly, interest expenses as a share of total firm expenses fall by a similar amount, about 60%. And a consequence of this is that because real debt burdens are eroded so much, uh, there's a massive decline in bankruptcy. So bankruptcies decline by over two thirds suggesting that this redistribution uh, to these firms that had a lot of debt reduced the incidence of financial distress. Next, to try to kind of get a little bit sharper identification of this debt inflation channel, we're gonna to go to the firm level and look in the cross section of firms. Uh, and what we'll show is two things. So first, show you evidence of redistribution. In particular, the firms that have the most net nominal exposure to the inflation by having higher leverage they're the ones that see the largest increase in their book and market equity values relative to firms uh, that have lower leverage. And these are also the firms that see the largest decline in their interest expenses, as you would expect, but sort of consistent with this idea of redistribution to the equity holders of these firms and from, from the bond holders. And not only is there redistribution, but this redistribution is associated with real effects. So the uh, firms that benefit the most from the inflation through their ex-ante leverage positions 
they're the ones that grow the most in terms of their employment during the inflation. And actually this effect uh, accounts for, in sort of a partial equilibrium sense, 75% of the overall increase in employment during the expansionary phase of Germany's hyperinflation. So we, we argue that this is a quantitatively potentially quite important effect. And third, we're gonna also think about this nominal rigidities channel by looking at the behavior of wage and price setting throughout the inflation at, at different levels of inflation. And what we'll see is that the frequency of wage and price adjustment is increasing with inflation. So as inflation rises, uh, wages, for example, are set at a higher and higher frequency, faster and faster, so that they essentially become flexible once inflation becomes very high, you know, above 100%. And what this suggests is that this debt inflation channel that we're documenting uh, can be active even if prices are, are flexible um, in line with some theory I'm gonna discuss. So let me just give kind of one slide of just kind of a conceptual framework for how, we, how we're thinking about this. In the paper, we write down a very kind of simple uh, model just to organize our thinking. I'm not gonna go through that. I'm just gonna give kind of the key intuitive um, takeaways that I think are useful for organizing the, the discussion. So we wanna think about how does inflation from money finance government spending transmit to real activity? So we're gonna have a simple model where firms issue nominal debt they can default on this debt. They're potentially financing constrained. And uh, there might be some uh, wage rigidity in the form of a menu cost. So with this uh, simple framework, we have three predictions. So first, if you have unexpected inflation, then you're gonna reduce uh, real debt burdens for these firms, and that's gonna reduce the incidence of bankruptcies. Second, what we call the debt inflation channel, this uh, relaxation in financing constraints that comes from the increase in net worth for these firms, that's gonna increase uh, output if these firms are financing constrained. And not only is it gonna increase output, this effect is gonna be especially strong for firms that have relatively more long-term debt as a share of, of, of total debt, because this long-term debt is gonna be less uh, repriced during the, uh, during the inflation. Uh, and third, we can look at the interaction between nominal rigidities and this debt inflation channel. What we find is that when there's low inflation, then inflation boosts output by reducing uh, the, re the real wage. However, uh, once inflation becomes very high, uh, workers you know, decide to readjust their wages or they bargain for, for more wages and wages then become essentially flexible. And what that means is that once wages are flexible, the only way in which inflation can have real effects is through this financial channel that we call the, the debt inflation uh, channel. So do you that, see a, a radical switch from one to the next? Is it like a regime change or is it a smooth transition? You know, is there a th threshold where is it we switch now to flexible wages? Yeah, it would depend on the assumption that you have on how, uh, how wages are set kind of in our simple framework where there's a menu cost. Um, when inflation is, is relatively low, your optimal wage um, is still close to uh, the actual real wage that you have. Um, and then it switches. So once inflation becomes very high, then all of a sudden with inflation, your, weight, your, your actual real wage goes very far from your optimal uh, real wage. And so then you decide to switch. So there's kind of this uh, threshold switching. But of course, it would depend on the specification of 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 the wage setting process. And we'll have some empirical evidence that, that suggests that this kind of menu cost uh, model prediction seems to be consistent with the data. And concerning, you know, you can adjust prices and wages every day as it happened, but you could also index it so they adjust automatically. Do you have any, you know, evidence whether there's indexing or non-indexing going on? And yeah. you can even switch to a dollar economy, dollarization. There is uh, evidence yes. for that. Exactly, and we know from other inflations, uh, especially in Latin America, that dollar, dollarization became widespread. So on the first part, in terms of indexation, wages did become indexed to the cost of living index uh, for public employees uh, in 1923. So that was kind of in the hyperinflation phase. Before that, wages are not indexed, but they're set by, by, by collective bargaining between uh, firms and, and unions. And you kind of see this race where wages are always trying to keep up uh, with, with prices. So there is an explicit indexation for most of the inflation. In terms of price setting, um, technically foreign currency pricing as part of the capital control laws in Germany was legal. So you, uh, was illegal. So you couldn't explicitly set your prices in, in dollars as firms would like to do. Um, but what happened as inflation became very high is that effectively 
uh, there was uh, exchange rate based pricing. So firms would look at the exchange rate, um, you know, every day, and then they would set their prices based on that uh, on that exchange rate. So the exchange rate became a very important anchor um, for how prices became became set. And there's one more question. Um, what about this intermediation in an environment of high inflation? Didn't people pull out the money from the banks and cut off the financing for the firms? Yes. So the, the credit crunch. I guess you will come to that. Okay. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, uh, the So one answer is that's actually a kind of a follow-up project that, that we're working on. So we hope to be able to say more about that soon. What we see right now, based on the data and reading the history, um, is that in the first phase of, of, of the inflation, as I'll talk about, people aren't expecting kind of more uh, more and more inflation, and so depositors keep their money in the banks, you know, even see term uh, term deposits. Then, as inflation you know uh, rises, gets higher and higher, and people all of a sudden you know essentially become very scared that the that the market is going to uh, completely collapse. Then you see deposits flow out. And there is kind of a credit tightening, credit crunch, and firms complain about sort of a shortage of, of financing for, for working capital. And that sort of happens in the second stage of the inflation, mm -hmm. um, which I'm going to get into uh, here in, in the historical background. And perhaps when you, as you go through this, more, one more question is like, do you see a lot of indexed bonds or debt instruments developing afterwards? Um, um, so in terms of the data on bonds, so we've, we've collected some of that data. Before the inflation, uh, there's no indexation um, of, of bonds. Uh, then what happens is by late 1922, 1923, once inflation becomes hyper, you do see that firms uh, and, and local municipalities, for example, start to issue bonds that are indexed to different commodities. So gold, or even you see things like rye index bonds and energy companies issue uh, bonds index to the price of electricity. So that becomes more more widespread, but it's a relatively small share of 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 of, of intermediation just because intermediation sort of uh, uh, deteriorates a lot during during the inflation. Mm -hmm. But you do see this this desire to go toward uh, to go toward indexation. Thanks. Great. So let me just provide a, a little bit of historical background just so that we're all on the same page and 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 because this is quite important for understanding the uh, the empirical uh, analysis that we have. So the roots of, of Weimar Germany's inflation lie in, in World War I. So Germany abandons the gold standard at the start of, uh, of World War I in August of 1914, and they finance their, their war spending uh, through deficits. They're less able to rely on uh, uh, external bond issuance than compared to, for example, the, the UK. So they have to do uh, more uh, uh, deficit finance spending, financed by uh, domestic loan issuance, a lot of which uh, ends up being bought by the Reichsbank. But interestingly, inflation in Germany during World War I was not you know, much larger than, for example, inflation in the UK, and it was similar to inflation in France. What, where the divergence really happens is in the post-war period, starting in 1919. And in this post-war period, there's two broad phases of the inflation that, that I want you to think about. The first is the high inflation phase, which runs from the World War I armistice, so that's uh, November of 1918, to June of 1922. During this phase, inflation expectations are relatively anchored um, and the economy is doing quite well. Credit is, 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 is available um, and you sort of have the expansionary phase of, 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 of the inflation. The second phase is in the hyperinflation phase. That's when inflation exceeds 50% per month. That's ushered in uh, in the summer of 1922 with a series of, of events, uh, including the assassination of the foreign minister, uh, as well as conflict over Germany's World War I reparations. And that runs from, uh, as I said, July 1922 until November of 1923. In terms of the broad important factors, uh, the literature sort of put emphasis on different uh, different key factors for understanding the inflation. It's quite clear that fiscal factors were very important. So first, the large and initially uncertain reparations uh, imposed on Germany at the Treaty of Versailles played an important role. And beyond reparations, Germany, uh, for for significant parts of the uh, of of the inflation, ran large non-reparation deficits uh, as well because of quite large um, social spending. Once inflation then got going, uh, the fiscal side deteriorated through this, what's sometimes referred to as the Tanzi effect, 
uh, collection lags so that once inflation was high, uh, when the government you know, went out and, and collected taxes, the real value of those tax collections uh, would be quite endogenously quite low because of high inflation and that increased the, the deficit further. Uh, other researchers put a lot of emphasis on the political economy dimensions, so in particular, the fact that the Weimar Republic you know, was a well, relatively you know, fragile uh, republic. And so politicians uh, lacked the political will to raise taxes and cut spending because they didn't want to disturb the social uh, peace because they were afraid of, 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 of you know, essentially you know, even re revolutions. Uh, beyond these fiscal and political economy factors, uh, there was massive monetary expansion because the Reichsbank uh, accommodated the increase in spending by discounting government and later also commercial uh, securities very, very freely. And they kept the discount rate very low for most of the, uh, the inflation. And then finally, I just want to mention, there's also a tradition that emphasizes the uh, balance of payments dimension, uh, which is related to reparations. Here, the argument is that large reparations uh, that had to be paid uh, in foreign currency required uh, Germany to go out and procure for foreign currency and sell marks. And that led to a foreign exchange depreciation, which fueled uh, domestic inflation uh, through the exchange rate uh, channel. So I think you know, all of these all of these stories uh, have have a fair bit of truth to them. So you can ask just during the First World War, inflation you said were fairly low. Was it because of price controls? So what role did price controls play? Yes, there, there was a fair bit of, of price controls uh, during uh, during World War One, and so some of the inflation that happens after the war is also, in a, in a way, kind of pent up inflation um, that comes because uh, prices uh, pr prices were being controlled, and the the, the economy was in large part um, uh, controlled. But interestingly, the inflation doesn't really accelerate uh, until after uh, the summer of 1919, so six seven months after the end of, of World War One. Uh, with the Treaty of, of, of Versailles. Um, that seems to be kind of a key shifter in terms of, of, of inflationary dynamics. So inflation expectations are, are obviously going to be very important. I think uh, the first point to mention is that prior to World War I in Germany, um, based on you know, data that we have, inflation had been very low. So on average from 1870 to 1914, inflation averaged at about 0.7% per year. Um, Germany was on, on the gold standard. Um, and the highest rate of inflation was 6% per year. So people just hadn't lived through very high inflation. Then there was high inflation during the war. So the price level increased by a factor of three. But many people sort of attributed this to the shortages of the war and not necessarily uh, to monetary expansion and, and, and fiscal deficits. And so what this meant was that in the post-war inflation, uh, there was actually expectations of mark appreciation that were very widespread. This is extensively documented in in, in uh, narrative historical research, for example, summarized by Kindleberger, many people were speculating that the mark would actually recover relative to the dollar uh, and to the pound. So there's even a famous story of John Maynard Keynes losing about half a million pounds in today's uh, money, speculating that the mark would actually uh, recover. You also see evidence of this expectations of mark appreciation and of low inflation uh, in the forward exchange market. So this figure here on the right shows the forward exchange premium of marks per sterling from when this forward market opened uh, in early 1921 uh, through this hyperinflation phase. And what you see is that up until the summer of 1922, uh, the mark is the mark forward rate is actually at a premium relative uh, to sterling, suggesting that you know people are not expecting a big depreciation of the mark during this time. Then this flips. Uh, in June and July uh, of 1922, because of this turmoil over reparations. And then you see that uh, expectations become unanchored and the forward premium turns into a large, uh, a, a large discount uh, as market participants start to expect further uh, depreciation. And that's sort of in line with the narrative evidence that after June 1922, there was a flight from the mark. Uh, and so kind of consistent uh, with this discussion we had before about uh, credit conditions, because of, of these expectation dynamics, in the first phase of the inflation, bank credit was sort of largely uh, available. Banks uh, uh, maintained uh, deposits. They were able to keep lending. But after the summer of, of 1922, credit conditions became very, very tight and external financing became essentially um, impossible. Another 
important point I just want to make about the historical context. So can context. I just come back? So it was essentially yes. also team transitory. So it was uh, transitory expectations in a sense, like yes. we have recently. You, you could say that there was, uh, exactly, you, you could say in a way that people thought that the rise in prices was transitory. And not only did they think that inflation would go down, they actually thought that the market would appreciate that there would be deflation. Yes. And I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that there hadn't been a high or hyperinflation you know, for a hundred years. The last, the, the last sort of comparable episode would have been during the French Revolution. And many people didn't even have a, a framework uh, to think about inflation in the way that we think about it today. So they thought, you know, many people thought about inflation as a, a, a shortage of goods because of, for example, the war and disruptions after the war leading to high prices rather than to uh, you know, just large uh, money supply and large deficits leading to inflation. So I think that's important that people didn't necessarily have the framework um, and they developed this sort of gradually over time uh, with, with the inflation. So there's sort of the two phases of the inflation also play out uh, in on the real side. Um, so the figure on the right here shows real GDP per capita. So this is annual data um, for Germany in red, and for other major economies, uh, excluding Germany here in blue. So other major economies, this is a weighted average uh, of 17 other uh, uh, major industrialized economies, including the US, the UK, France, um, and so on. And what you see is that uh, while the, the other major economies, you know, especially the, U, the UK and the US are going through uh, what was known at the time as the depression of 1920-21 because of very restrictive monetary policies and attempts to get back to the gold standard. Germany from 1919 to 1922 is actually booming. Um, so uh, uh, German growth is quite strong uh, during this period. Uh, unemployment is very low and Germany avoids this uh, 2021 um, de uh, uh, depression. So for kind of the first phase of the inflation, the economy is actually doing quite quite well. Um, which might be surprising to you, given that this hyperinflation is often remembered um, as, as a disaster. Um, but then uh, in late 1922 and going into 1923, 1923 there's this large uh, collapse in output. So output falls by about 15%. And this is due to a combination of factors that are a bit difficult to disentangle. The first is the hyperinflation itself, which clearly became very disruptive for, for economic activity um, because you know the credit shortage, because of price dispersion, just the difficulty of doing business, you see that unemployment, for example, starts to go up at the end of 1922. Then in January of 1923, there's the Ruhr crisis. So the invasion of the Ruhr by France and Belgium in order um, to extract reparations in kind. And this leads to a, a passive resistance and a halting of, of production. Um, and that explains really, I think this big collapse uh, in, in output. And then the third factor is by the second half of 1923, uh, Germany is already preparing for the stabilization. Discount rates are, are rising um, at, at the Reichsbank, uh, and the stabilization is also leading people to expect that there's going to be, you know, big uh, uh, fiscal consolidation um, and tight monetary conditions going forward. And so 1923 is therefore really this kind of disastrous year in terms of, of GDP growth. So again, it's useful to kind of think about these two phases of the inflation. So Emil can ask you, how seriously do you take this figure? Because I could make a case that in the long run, actually, it was good to run this hyperinflation. It was a one bad year. But if we go from 1918 to 1927, Germany did better, rather than going back to the gold standard, what the that's UK good, did. And yeah, that's a, that's a you know, very, very, very difficult. pushing it too hard? It's probably pushing it too hard, because I think you know after 1923, the sort of good growth, uh, uh, the reasonably decent growth that happened sort of in, in the second half of, of the 1920s uh, in Germany. But was it because the debt was wiped out and that's why the growth was doing so well, even subsequently? Well, what we're going to see just in terms of the, the, our analysis is that most of the benefits that come from this debt being wiped out, they really show up in the early phase of, of, of the inflation. So 1919, 1920, 1921, and then they've largely dissipated by then, and we don't see sort of clear evidence of those benefits later on. Um, and in fact, there is sort of, I'm not going to talk too much about this today, but there is sort of discussion of the, of the stabilization crisis. So 1924, 25 are actually relatively bad years in terms of unemployment because of the aftermath of the hyperinflation. 
um, and sort of the cleaning up that had to be uh, done. So one, you know, many firms had overexpanded, they had to rationalize their production. There was also some debts that were revalued uh, that led to increases in debt burdens um, for some firms that, that led to increases in, in defaults. So I think actually, you know, Peter Garber, for example, has a paper from, from the early 1980s where he argues that actually the hyperinflation also uh, created difficulties uh, for German growth in 1924 and 25 uh, as well. So I think the way I would think about it is that the, the inflation benefited growth sort of in the short run. And then in the medium run, it you know combined with this with this political uh, rural crisis was very bad for, for for output, and in terms of the long run, I think just the fact that you know Germany was a growing industrializing economy that had a lot of productivity uh, advancements as, as well. Um, so the blue line is of, equal yeah. weighted, or is it value it's, weighted? Uh, it's valuated. So okay. you know, the U.S., for example, would have uh, the most weight, followed by the U.K., France, and and so on. Yes. So, and you see this when comparing Germany to most other countries, except for France, actually, which has very, very high growth uh, starting in 1918 from a very, very low base because so much of, of the French industrial capacity was destroyed mm -hmm. during the war. But when I measured German GDP, all the GDP which was produced and then shipped over for reparation payments is part of the red line. Yes, this, yes, this comes from exact production. So. You know, reparations, which amounted to, uh, you know, nominally at least to between six to ten percent of, of GDP, that wouldn't be subtracted there. So it, exactly, A, another way to, I guess, to ask that question is to say, well, the hyperinflation is, or the inflation is remembered as sort of a disaster. What was happening to people's consumption? We don't have great data on this, but we mm -hmm. do know that you know real wages declined considerably, especially in 1919, 1920, um, and then they sort of raced to. Uh, to keep up, but a lot of this GDP, you know, wasn't fueling consumption; it was fueling investment, and um, some of it was being transferred abroad. At the same time, there's actually pretty big capital inflows going into Germany in the first part of the of, of the inflation because of the speculation on the mark. So there's this quote: one of the early uh, students of the German hyperinflation was Frank Graham, who was actually a Princeton uh, uh, economist, and what he said was that that business in Germany was booming during most of the inflation period is a universally admitted fact. I think this quote is useful um, just because this figure often comes as a bit of a surprise to people. So let me talk uh, about the data. So we're gonna bring some newly digitized firm level data uh, in order to study this debt inflation channel. The data source is uh, from this investor's manual called Salings. Um, and this gives us balance sheets and income statements for about 700 firms per year. So just to give you an example of the data, on the right here uh, is data uh, from this manual from Siemens, uh, so a precursor to the modern Siemens uh, concern. Um, and you know, if you could read German, or if you can read German, what this tells you is you, know, you have information on incomes, uh, revenues, different types of costs, uh, expenses like interest expenses, and then quite detailed uh, balance sheet items. And so we've digitized and har harmonized all of this uh, year by year, uh, letting us uh, look at what's happening to these roughly 700 firms per year through the inflation. We're also gonna co collect information on uh, bond uh, issuance by firms so that we know, you know which firms have outstanding bonds and how long the maturity is. One challenge that's important to emphasize um, is that this is before gap inflation accounting. Um, so the inflation uh, severely distorts accounting, especially in 1923. What you see when you look at these data is that real items, like for example, firms, plant, and equipment is significantly undervalued relative to nominal items like their uh, treasury holdings or, or, or cash holdings. Um, and this is especially a concern in 1923 when, when inflation is very, very high. So to deal with this concern, we have a few different uh, so solutions to this challenge. So one, um, we use what are called revalued gold mark balance sheets, which were required by law for all firms to produce by January 1st, 1924. Um, so these revalued gold mark balance sheets, firms were asked to draw up new balance sheets where they tried to construct the market value uh, of the assets and liabilities that they had in gold marks or in stable marks. And these balance sheets are, you know, they're not perfect, but they're considered to be much more reliable by historians. Uh, than, for example, the 1923 nominal balance sheets. 
Beyond that, we're going to look at variables that are immune to this measurement error. So we're going to look at employment, which we have for about 300 firms, and stock prices uh, from a newspaper from the time. So just to give you a sense of the stock price data, this is from the Berliner Börsenzeitung, which is a newspaper that would report uh, daily stock prices for all uh, industrial firms. So we get stock prices and dividends uh, from here. So with these data, uh, we first start by looking at some aggregate evidence on this debt inflation channel. And the figure on the left here shows the distribution of firm leverage at the onset of the post-war inflation in 1919 here in red, and then in the aftermath of the inflation using these revalued gold mark balance sheets in 1924. And what you see is that in 1919, the median firm had book leverage defined as, as, as book liabilities over assets of about 50%. By 1924, this had fallen by about half. So this tells you two things. One, the inflation led to a large erosion of liabilities, most of which were nominal. And two, firms are still able though to continue borrowing to some extent during the inflation. Uh, so this doesn't completely go to zero. Firms still have some liabilities even in the aftermath of the inflation. On the right here, I'm showing you interest uh, as a share of total expenses and salaries and materials as a share of total expenses over time, um, indexed uh, uh, here to zero in 1918. And what you see is that this reduction in firm's leverage also shows up in their interest expenses as a share of total expenses. So as inflation rises, firm's uh, interest expenses as a share of total expenses falls by about five, six percentage points. This suggests that you know, firms that you know, were uh, making interest payments to their debt holders, the banks, the bondholders, all of a sudden have more cash flow that they could potentially uh, devote to other things, either to paying out equity holders or for example, to uh, investing. You don't see uh, the similar dynamics for the share of salaries and materials. Uh, so uh, input costs in production relative to total expenses, those are relatively stable throughout the inflation. So, so you kind of see this, this dichotomy between uh, these financial expenses and the real expenses through, throughout the inflation. So the blue line, can you do it for salaries alone as well, just to see the, the wage stickiness when the real wage is declining essentially? We, we can do that. I would expect so, that the wages go down further in real terms than the materials. Than the materials. And, and, and that's certainly true. So we have data on wages in the, in the paper. And you see that um, in the first part, sort of 1919, 1920, real wages do go down, especially for more skilled workers and mm -hmm. workers kind of at the higher end yes. of the wage uh, distribution. Because of, of, of sort of the fact that these firms don't report these data in a harmonized way, but we have to go to this source that looks like this and sort of try yes. to break out what the different types of expenses are. Like, you know, for this firm, you have interest expenses, depreciation, and so on. We kind of try to maximize the sample by combining salaries and materials. We could also look at salaries uh, separately. It would be a smaller sample, but I suspect you would see that the salary share does go down, especially in the beginning, because of this, this uh, real wage uh, decline uh, that, that you mentioned. The real wage decline channel, though, is really kind of operating in the early phase. Um, once, once inflation picks up, you really see that wages become adjusted uh, more frequently and they're kind of racing to keep up with prices. So this reduction in firms' real debt burdens, um, that's associated with a large decline in bankruptcies and the incidence of financial distress. So just one simple way to see this is through the scatter plot, where on the y-axis here, I'm just plotting the total number of bankruptcies in Germany in a given quarter. Uh, and each observation here is, is a quarter. On the x-axis, I'm plotting inflation from four quarters ago to this quarter. And inflation here is based on the wholesale price index. And what you see is that as inflation rises, the incidence of bankruptcies declines quite sharply. Um, so that kind of during this first phase of the inflation up until the summer of 1922, bankruptcies fall by about two thirds. Then as inflation kind of rises and gets higher and higher and becomes hyperinflation, uh, then the additional benefits of inflation in terms of reducing firms' real debt burdens, well, those sort of dissipate because debts have already been wiped out. Uh, and so additional inflation doesn't have much of a relationship with bankruptcies after that. So you get this sort of downward sloping and you know, convex relationship between inflation uh, and, and, and bankruptcies. But it's suggesting that these firms, non-financial firms are, are really benefiting from this erosion in their debt burden. 
We can also look at what happens to the behavior of, of wages uh, and prices. And this goes back to some of the discussion that we had um, earlier. So the, these figures here compare the frequency with which wages and prices are adjusted against inflation. So for example, on the left here is the average number of days that have passed since wages were last increased. And this is based on an average of uh, wages uh, that are negotiated by unions across seven industries. Um, and what you see here is that when inflation is, is relatively low, so between zero, uh, zero to 50%, Wages are adjusted every 180 to 270 days. So you know every six months to, to nine months or so. Then as inflation rises, the frequency with which wages are, are adjusted uh, rises so that the average number of days elapsed since a wage increase uh, declines. And once inflation exceeds about 100%, wages are adjusted every 60 days or so. Once inflation exceeds 200%, they're adjusted every 30 days uh, or, or even less. Um, so we interpret this as saying that once inflation becomes quite high, wages appear essentially flexible. We can do the same thing for some newly digitized data that we have that underlie the cost of living uh, index. So these are representative prices of goods in 17 major uh, cities. Um, and what you see is that, again, as when inflation is relatively low, uh, prices are only adjusted every you know, 90 to 100 days. But then once inflation becomes high and you know, exceeds about 75%, uh, prices are being adjusted every 30 days uh, or even less. Um, and this you know, pattern of an increasing frequency uh, of wage and price adjustment with inflation is most consistent with state-dependent menu cost models. This, for example, this very nice paper by Fernando Alvarez and co-authors uh, showed uh, using data from Argentina. The patterns are actually very similar uh, to other hyperinflations um, as well. And an implication of this, if you take the menu cost model seriously, is that there's relatively limited scope of an expansionary effect through the nominal rigidity channel once inflation becomes very high. And so kind of the, the main channel that then uh, is gonna operate in terms of being expansionary is gonna be this debt inflation channel. So let me turn to some firm level evidence on this debt inflation channel in order to get some sharper identification uh, and to quantify the extent uh, of, of, of the debt inflation channel in terms of increasing uh, real activity. Can, can I throw in a question from Howard yes. Bloom? Uh, so, you know, the equivalent in a debt thing of the frequency of adjusting prices would be the maturity of the nominal debt. Yes. Uh, and he would like to know what was, you know, if you look at corporate debt issuance, what was the average maturity in the beginning of the inflation period? Was it 10-year fixed or was it floating fixed or was it, you know, what was the corporate bond structure? Yes. Great question. So in terms of, of of the information on the bonds. I'll show that a, a little bit later, but mm -hmm. what you see is that about half of the firms in our sample, 51%, uh, have fixed rate bonds outstanding. Um, and so bonds were generally always at, at fixed rate. Um, the typical coupon at the time was about four and a half, four to four and a half percent. Um, and the bonds uh, that are outstanding in 1920, as I'll show you, their final repayment date uh, on average is in 1940. So the typical remaining maturity on these on these bonds is quite long. So the, they have a re remaining maturity of about uh, of about uh, 20, 20 years and a maturity of about 30 years or so when, when they're issued. So on the bond side, firms really are benefiting from very long-term fixed rate financing. Um, on the bank credit side, it's a little bit more difficult for us to know the exact uh, terms of, of the loan contracts for, for banks. Um, the narrative historical evidence, was, which is what we can rely on here, suggests that banks are gradually uh, increasing the rate at which uh, they're lending. Um, but importantly, many of bank loans in general were uh, indexed to the Reichsbank's dis discount rate. And for much of the inflation up until 1922, the Reichsbank is keeping its discount rate very, very low. Um, you know, in part, that's sort of part of the problem why there's this, this inflation. And that means that actually in terms of the pass-through of bank lending rates into the price of, of corporate loans, um, that's, that's sort of only rising gradually as the Reichsbank increases its discount rate. That's one more question I can throw in now uh, in yes. a sense. In the early phase of the inflation phase, when we, before we move into hyperinflation and uh, wages are still sticky, you erode the real wage income of households and that also yes. should depress demand and uh, demand for goods, that should hurt the revenue of the firms as well. Should this lead to an increase in bankruptcy? Uh, 
is this a force in the other direction? And uh, why is it not overwhelming the force you depicted in the data? Yes, that, that, that's an interesting question. So actually in our, in our model, that's precisely what's happening. Um, so households are, are losing out both because their real wages are, are, are declining um, and because uh, they're losing, uh, they're losing uh, their savings through the erosion of, of these debt contracts um, that are being wiped out, wiped out because uh, of, of inflation. So in our model, um, the expansionary effect of the reduction in real wages on uh, labor demand is the one that's going to dominate. And that generally happens in these in these sticky wage um, uh, sticky wage models because households are willing to supply any amount of labor uh, that firms demand at that given wage. That's sort of typically the assumption that that you have. In terms of that depressing um, domestic demand, we don't see so much evidence uh, for that in in the data. Um, many of these firms are you know tradable firms are selling, you know, not just in Germany, but all over the world. So that might be part of the reason why they're not sort of affected by this decline in, in domestic demand. The one other thing I'll, I'll say is that in our model, and you have some historical evidence for this, when households become poorer because they lose their savings, they actually, you know, may want to work more. So there's kind of this general equilibrium effect where uh, this wealth loss for households can increase labor supply. Um, and it's hard for us to have sort of systematic evidence for this, but there's a lot of, you know, just historical examples of people who were reliant on fixed incomes, who actually all of a sudden had to go out into the labor market and start working. Um, and so, you know, labor was relatively abundant at the time, in part for this reason. Okay, so let me uh, uh, look at uh, some firm level evidence on this debt inflation channel. We want to think about, you know, can we see it in the cross section of firms? Um, and does it merely redistribute wealth or does it affect real activity? So we're going to use two simple measures of firm level exposure to this debt inflation channel. And they're both going to be measured as of the onset of the inflation. So averaged over 1918 and 1919. It doesn't really matter how you, how you do it, but we thought this was a reasonable way of measuring it. The first is going to be liabilities over assets, like I showed you before. That's one minus book equity over assets measured as of 1918-19. And the second measure is financial debt relative to assets. So this is sort of a subset of the overall liabilities measure that also includes non-financial liabilities like accrued pensions, accrued wages, and, and, and so on. We think the firm level analysis has several advantages. So first, it's gonna let us be a little bit sharper in terms of identification. We're gonna be able to control for time varying shocks that are affecting firms, including firms in different industries, um, and firms with different characteristics. We're gonna be able to kind of quantify the, how much redistribution there actually is. Uh, and we're gonna be able to estimate the real effect uh, on employment, which is a variable that we think is appealing because it's uh, immune to some of these measurement issues during inflation. As an initial exercise, let me just take the sample of firms that we have and sort them into three bins based on their leverage at the onset of the inflation in 1918, 1919. So this figure here shows the evolution of employment for low leverage firms in red, firms with intermediate leverage in light blue, and firms with high leverage, so the highest tercile of leverage in dark blue. They're all indexed to 100 in 1918 again. What you see is that overall, uh, just like with the GDP figure, this employment data, which comes from the self-reported uh, firm's employment, also shows that you know, uh, employment is rising uh, during the first phase of the inflation up to 1922. And then there's sort of a contraction in employment that happens uh, between 1922 and 1923, 1924. Second, the expansion in employment is really concentrated amongst high leverage firms, the firms that I've argued would benefit most from this debt inflation channel, followed by these intermediate leverage firms. And finally, low leverage firms are also expanding, but, but much less than these high leverage firms. So we can do this a, a, a little bit more formally. Um, by estimating a specification that's going to let us control uh, for various differences across firms in a way that the previous figure uh, wouldn't allow. So I'm going to estimate a regression of uh, log firm employment on a firm fixed effect, uh, time fixed effects, and potentially industry time fixed effects. That's what the S here represents, the sector. And then I'm going to sort firms by their liabilities relative to their assets at the onset of the inflation in 1918-1919. Uh, and I'm going to compare the evolution of firms with high liabilities to assets relative to low liabilities to assets, fixing 1918 as the benchmark year. So we can do this 
but only firm and year fixed effects. And what we see is that these high leverage firms, they see relatively stronger employment growth, uh, especially in 1920, 21, 22. Um, and then it sort of peters out uh, by the end of the inflation in 23, 24. In terms of magnitudes, what this uh, estimate here means uh, is that if I increase uh, leverage by 10 percentage points, that's associated with 5% stronger employment growth from 1918 uh, to 1922. Now, there's, you might have lots of concerns uh, with this type of exercise. You might worry that the firms that have high leverage, they're just you know, gonna be different from firms that have lower leverage. So one concern you might have is that they might be in different industries. We know capital structure varies a lot across industries and it might just be that the industries with high leverage, they're the ones that are doing the best. So to deal with this, I'm gonna put in industry by year fixed effects uh, for relatively detailed industries um, that correspond to sort of roughly two digit SIC industries today. And you see that even within industries, the firms that have a higher leverage, they're the ones that grow the most uh, during the inflation in terms of their employment. We can also control uh, for firm characteristics like firm size, uh, firm profitability, um, firms uh, fixed assets as a share of total assets, sort of standard uh, financial characteristics at the onset of the inflation to make sure that this leverage effect that we're identifying is really about leverage and not about one of these other characteristics. And you see that you know here uh, in this dark blue, uh, estimates, these are quite similar. Now, the final story is what a uh, concern is a story that we've already talked about, which is about what's happening on the credit supply side, on the intermediation uh, side. So you might worry that, well, firms with low leverage, um, they might you know, be connected to different banks that are cutting their credit uh, supply relatively more. Um, and so in order to deal with that, we're going to put in bank time fixed effects. What this is going to do is essentially compare a firm with high leverage to a firm with low leverage that have a relationship with the same bank, for example, Deutsche Bank. Um, and so that's gonna take out sort of any overall contraction in credit uh, that Deutsche Bank is doing at, at the time. We're also gonna control for firms distance to Berlin um, as a proxy for their access to the Reichsbank's uh, discount window. Um, when we do that, you know, we see again, quite similar patterns. So this expansionary debt inflation channel that's running from 1918 to 1922, it, you know, it doesn't seem to be uh, confounded by one of these other, uh, other factors. We can also you know, try to corroborate this debt inflation ch channel story uh, a little bit more by looking at uh, what happens to uh, other aspects of, of, of firms' performance. So this figure here shows a, a similar estimation exercise, but it looks at the share of interest expenses as a share of total expenses. And what you see is that it's precisely the firms that have higher leverage, again, measured as liabilities over assets, the, that are the ones that see the largest decline in their interest expenses as a share of total expenses. So these are really the firms that are benefiting most just you know, in cash flow terms by having to make fewer interest uh, payments in real terms uh, to their bank and to their bondholders. What happens in, in the equity market? Um, so what we do here, uh, is we look at fir firms' performance uh, in the stock market during the inflation from 1919 to 1923. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort firms into five portfolios based on their lag leverage again, to kind of get at this debt inflation channel. Um, and this figure here shows you the average return uh, across these portfolios from the low leverage portfolio to the highest leverage uh, portfolio. Um, and what you see is that Firms that are in the high leverage portfolios, they do relatively better compared to firms that are in the low leverage uh, portfolios. Um, all firms have pretty poor stock returns during the inflation, um, but high leverage firms do relatively better. So that for example, a portfolio that went long high leverage firms and short low leverage firms would have had 13% higher returns per year during the, uh, the inflation period. Uh, and this is a, a quite significant uh, difference. So what this is telling you is that there is evidence of this redistribution from debt to equity holders um, in contrast to the more limited evidence that we have uh, from other inflations like the 1970s uh, period. Uh, and finally, let me just talk a little bit more about long-term bond financing. So I think I've already talked about most of what happened uh, uh, in uh, most of what this, this uh, slide is gonna show, but what it shows so is actually that- Actually, there's a question if I may yes. ask this. Uh, 
you know, Howard Bloom would, would like to know who is actually the holder of this low interest debt issuance. Now, these German banks, foreigners, um, yeah. although defaults may not occur, they might be subject to crashing mark to market evaluations. Is there anything you can say yes. about that? Um, so, what we know is, you know, on the loan side, uh, the holders of these loans are, are, are uh, banks. So banks you know, mainly provide working capital. So credit banks mainly provide working capital financing um, at the time. And the banks really do suffer during the inflation. I just want, want, want to be clear about that. So kind of on the, on the credit supply side, if you look at, for example, uh, banks' uh, real equity, uh, their equity declines by about two thirds during the inflation. So there's a big reduction in their, in their real capitalization. So they, they lose out from this, even though they also sort of benefit in, in other ways from, from the inflation that we can we can talk about. Then if you look at the long-term bonds, I think those are wide, widely held amongst uh, the, the population. So they're held by uh, insurance companies, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, life insurance, uh, uh, for example, they're also held by, by private individuals. Uh, and those people are the ones who lose out during the inflation. And actually, you know, later on, they kind of try to form uh, coalitions in order to advocate that they should have some compensation be, uh, because of, of, of this loss. And so this kind of becomes a political economy issue later on down the road. Um, but yeah, so the, the bond holdings, the losses are relatively dispersed. On the loans, the losses are going to be concentrated on the credit banks. And that's going to show up you know, on the credit supply side, especially in the second phase of the inflation. Did you see one word, you know, in 1924, when there was a revelation of the bonds through political lobbying, was this the reason why then these firms, you know, came back, the high leverage firms did not have more employment anymore subsequently, because suddenly the debt came back? Or um, can you say a few words on this? So, so, yes. Yeah, so, so, so what happens is that uh, there's this sort of long political economy kind of debate between the, the creditors who had lost out. Um, and you know, other, other parties, including kind of mainstream politicians who really didn't want to have a debt reva a revaluation. And they settle on a compromise uh, where mortgages are revalued by 20%. Um, other types of bonds are revalued by between 10 and 15%. But the revaluation terms are quite generous on the, on the debtor side. Um, so the firms, they, they all of a sudden have these revalued uh, uh, loans, but the interest rates are very low and they don't have to start making repayments until 1932. And actually once 1932 comes, then there's subsequent moratoria um, as well. So there's some evidence of, of rising defaults at the time, which might be related to this, uh, this revaluation. I think another reason just why there's, a, there's sort of a temporary boom uh, from this, which then sort of peters out, is that some of the firms may have overexpanded during the, uh, dur during, during the inflation. So they benefit from uh, this reduction in debt they don't really know what to do with the cash flow that they have, and so they, you know, invest it in plant equipment, land. Um, they hire more workers, um, and you know, once the stabilization comes, some of this, you know, uh, expansion reverses as as firms kind of try to cut costs and, and rationalize them, mm -hmm. themselves. And I think that explains part of the reversal. Thanks. So, if you look at, you know, what types of bonds did firms have outstanding at the onset of the inflation? Here's a, a figure which shows, shows a snapshot uh, of when bonds were issued and when they are repaid. Um, so if you're looking at 1918, 1919, uh, the typical firm issued bonds, the median is in 1906. And some of them had issued bonds as far back as the 1880s, um, but most of them were issued before World War I. Then uh, you know, there's some issuance that comes back right after the war. During World War I, there isn't much issuance, but some issuance does come back in the aftermath, kind of consistent with this idea that inflation isn't uh, anticipated. And these long-term bonds, they have pretty long repayment terms. So the typical uh, firm uh, only finishes repaying its long-term bonds 20 years later in, in 1940. And, you know, some of them have repayment terms that go all the way into the 1950s, 1960s. Um, so these firms that are in our sample that have long-term bonds, um, many of them have very, you know, very long-term uh, bonds that they're, they're reliant on. So we can use the idea that this debt inflation channel should be especially strong for the firms that have long-term financing that isn't subject to repricing during the inflation. So what we do here is we estimate this, this uh, specification that I showed you before, uh, but we'll do it separately for firms that have uh, low versus high 
uh, share of debt being long-term. Um, so this figure here uh, shows the result of this exercise for the interest expense shares and for employment. So you see that you know, for all firms, interest expenses go down uh, as a share of total expenses, uh, especially for firms that have higher debt uh, relative to their assets. But this effect is much stronger for firms that are in the highest quartile of their long-term debt as a share of total debt. Whereas firms that have you know, very little long-term debt and have a lot of short-term debt that is subject to some repricing, they see you know, relatively smaller effects on, on interest expenses. Similarly, if we look at employment, the pattern isn't quite so clear, but it's, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly there. You see that the strongest employment gains come precisely for the firms that have the highest share uh, of, of long-term debt in total debt, while the smallest effects uh, come for firms that have the lowest share of, of, of long-term debt. Uh, in, in total debt, kind of consistent with this idea that this debt inflation channel is going to be stronger for firms that have a more long maturity debt. Okay, let me conclude here. So what we've tried to do in this paper is to revisit this classic uh, episode of the German hyperinflation and provide some aggregate and firm level evidence on the role of this debt inflation channel, which appears to be quite important during this context. Um, so what we find is that there's clear evidence of redistribution, redistribution toward the equity holders of net debtor firms, and that seems to have real effects. And the key friction that seems to matter here uh, is long-term nominal debt and financing constraints rather than nominal rigidities. Now, what's the aggregate importance of this uh, shock? Well, uh, if we do sort of a simple partial equilibrium aggregation of our estimates, it implies that this debt inflation channel accounts for about a 14% employment increase from 1918 to 1922 during the expansionary phase of, of, of this inflation, which is about 75% of the total effect. Um, so this debt inflation channel uh, it, it appears to be expansionary and it can work even if prices are flexible. Now, of course, in terms of aggregate effect, effects of the inflation, uh, you also wanna think about the other side, which we've been discussing several times, which is this credit supply side, so we're trying to do more uh, about this in the next paper, but it's pretty clear that uh, credit supply does contract, especially in the second phase of the inflation, and that that was a, a strong dampening uh, and maybe even overall contractionary effect uh, once inflation became hyper. Finally, you know, let me just say a couple of words about external validity, because I think this type of analysis is always going to invite uh, those types of questions. Um, you know, we think that in by studying such a high uh, uh, inflation episode, we can kind of clearly identify a channel that might also matter during more moderate inflations, but that's going to be more difficult to see. At the same time, you know, we have to be open to the fact that relevant channels might be different during smaller inflation. So price stickiness, for example, might matter more. Um, when monetary policy responds sharply, um, that's gonna have different effects on financial conditions relative to if monetary policy doesn't respond, like in this episode. Uh, and finally, the structure of debt contracts matters. So this debt inflation channel is going to be particularly strong when firms have fixed rate, long-term, and domestic currency debt. If you're in other environments where there's floating debt that's being repriced or foreign currency debt that, that's subject to this uh, you know, opposite uh, valuation effects from exchange rate depreciation, you can get much weaker, even you know, uh, uh, inverse effects uh, of, of, of this uh, debt, debt channel. Um, so, you know, whether this debt inflation channel is operative in other settings really depends on what financial system and financial contracts look like during that setting. So thanks a lot for, uh, for your questions and for having me and happy to take some more questions if there are any. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Emil. So we have some more questions. So in particular, I would like to come back to the poll questions as well. The last poll question, that's also what Ron Anderson would like to know. What is, was a good hedge then against this inflation at that period and what are the lessons for today is it you know probably did we know that bonds not but how was the performance of equity versus bonds commodities and real estate uh, yeah i mean if you was on this with, with the benefit benefit of hindsight uh the best hedge would obviously have been to go for a foreign currency and that's certainly what many many people did and many firms did this uh for example siemens as i showed you before by 1922 uh, half of their cash holdings were in, in, in foreign currency. So that's that's kind of uh, obviously the best hedge, but there were capital controls that made it difficult, especially for some ordinary people uh, to do that. Um, then in terms of, of hedges, uh, in the long-term, so bonds were, were obviously the worst. Uh, shares 
do relatively poorly, but at least they do retain their real values and the stock market does recover in the second half of the 1920s. So, you know, in the medium term, stock, uh, shares would have been relatively uh, uh, reasonable uh, hedge, at least better than uh, bonds, which many people were reliant on. Um, and then in the medium term, uh, real estate would also have been an okay hedge, but in the short term, it was a very bad hedge uh, because um, landlords suffered a lot because of uh, price uh, restrictions on rents. So they couldn't raise rents with inflation, which meant that essentially the cash flow coming from real estate investments went essentially to, uh, to, to, to zero. Um, so I think those, uh, those types of assets that are known to provide partial hedges against inflation uh, in other times like real estate and, 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 and stocks of non-financial firms also do relatively, uh, relatively better, but are still not perfect hedges here. I think more broadly, the evidence that we have on hedges against uh, inflation is, is kind of very similar. Um, so real estate is a partial hedge against inflation. If you look across you know, many countries over long periods of, of time, it's not perfect. Uh, and the stock market is also a, a kind of a partial hedge against inflation, but, but not perfect. So you made a very good case that you know the inflation was not anticipated at all because we had more than 100 years of very low inflation and uh, people were speculating in the FX market that uh, you know the Deutsche Mark will uh, gain in value as well. Do you think these results are very specific to cases where you know the inflation expectations are always very low and transitory? Uh, or can we draw conclusions even for other cases where inflation goes up and people don't have a strong inflation anchor. Would it be for Latin American countries where there's no strong inflation anchor? Would you say what the, the fact is the same, but was just not so pronounced or it would be not there at all because bond I, price I, would price it in? Yes, exactly. I think that if inflation you know, becomes anticipated, then the contractionary effects of higher expected inflation through financial channels can dominate this debt inflation channel. So I think what happens is, you know, if you have a, what's important in terms of inflation expectations for financial channels, when you have long-term contracts is not whether inflation next year is anticipated this year, but whether it was anticipated when debt contracts were signed. And so if you do have, uh, you know, medium to, to long-term debt contracts that are fixed rate, then this channel can still be operative if inflation is anticipated uh, in, the, in the short term, as long as it wasn't anticipated when contracts were signed. But if you know you you are in an environment where people are used to relatively high inflation, um, and they're not willing to enter long-term financing in the first place, um, then the benefits of of high inflation are going to be much weaker through this channel, mm -hmm. because as you said, debt is going to be repriced. Um, you know, interest rates are going to be uh, higher because people you know require higher compensation. And then I think if you're in the world of firms being financing constrained then the contractionary ch uh, channels become more important. Because for example, if you have a firm that faces a working capital constraint um, and needs to borrow from banks in order to pay its employees and to you know, buy materials, then if you have an increase in nominal interest rates that comes from an in increase in expected inflation, even if there's no increase in the real rate, that actually tightens the firm's working capital uh, constraint. And so you can have sort of a contractionary effect that comes from uh, from from having less less working capital through this financing channel, you know, even if real rates haven't gone gone up yet, the nominal rate itself mm -hmm. might matter. And I think that's if you're in a if you're in a setting where people have experienced very high inflation and think that very high inflation could come back, that seems to be more important. And and then you're going to be more likely to have kind of a financial system that's been adapted to that. I think that's been the experience of many inflations, especially in Latin America in the post-war period. So let's uh, we always end with a positive note, a quick positive note, perhaps, uh, and also lessons for today. Uh, what are the main lessons and positive? What's a, is there any positive note from this analysis? Where saying that's a good outcome, we should learn from that, and that will help us in the current circumstances. I don't know if it's a, certainly uh, if it's a positive note from the perspective of, of combating inflation for the Fed, but I do think that if you want to think about how this debt inflation channel might matter today and the role of, of financial frictions. Um, it seems plausible to me, for example, that you know during COVID when we saw high inflation, um, 
many people, uh, homeowners who had long-term fixed rate debts, 30 year fixed rate, they had borrowed at maybe two and a half, three, three and a half percent. Um, even though their wages didn't go up as much as inflation, if their wages still went up um, because of some inflation, they actually would have you know, benefited uh, from this. And that might be part of the reason why we have, you know, relative, have had relatively strong household demand, relatively mm -hmm. strong uh, balance sheets. And that's of course been one of the reasons why um, you know, demand has been strong and that's led to more uh, inflation. And so I think in a, in, in a way that's, that's sort of a, something that you know, we need to think about even, even kind of in the present uh, context that that might've been a way in which inflation may have stimulated uh, demand. Thanks a lot, Emil. I hope you're, you locked in a mortgage rate for 30 years at 2.5% or 2.8%. And uh, <laughs> uh, we stay, stay in touch and keep on pushing this line of research. Thanks again, and uh, I see you soon. Thanks, Marcus. See you soon. Thanks to everybody for coming. And next week, we will have a discussion with Bill Dudley, the former president of the New York Fed, talking about the lessons from the banking crisis. Hope to see you again. Thanks for joining us this time. Bye-bye.